call you a steward, but you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, hello from, from Munich, sunny Munich, and it's really nice to be with everybody, at least remotely. And so to continue with the theme, uh, we'll talk about today the estimating relative paleo intensity for remnants and isotropy, and I should really include sediments uh, here. So I'm only going to talk about like DRM acquisition. And so what you can see here, just some motivation, if we have two stacked curves and we want to know how the field has changed over time, we can see some similarities and some differences. And so the question is, is how and when can we trust this database? That's really the goal that I'd like to address today. Um, so, uh, and, and kind of the, the background of why we're doing what we're doing comes from these kind of viscous models with Yosef Yezhak, and he applied what are called Jeffrey's equations. So you could make kind of particles here. In this case, they're prolate particles. And, and so the moment is in the long axis direction. So the open circles are in the upper hemisphere, the lower circles, the, the, the solid circles are in the lower hemisphere. And what we could do is we can have a magnetic field direction that's this X, and we can turn on the field. We could apply a, a certain viscosity with a certain force couple, and we can watch uh, the, the evolution of the system. And in this case, we start off with a perfect random distribution of moments. And we could see that after you know, one time step that we track the magnetic field. So the, 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 the diamond is the magnetic field direction recorded by the sum of the moments. And the little red star is the maximum elongation axis. And this is exactly what you should expect if you have perfect recording of the magnetic field, that if I have a prolate particle, a uniaxial particle, that that particle, if it's pointing in the magnetic field direction, uh, that the maximum axis of anisotropy should also be in that direction, okay? And so you can see that here. And in this case, uh, already at the first time step, this is the relative paleo intensity. So this is much too high. So even though the distribution of these moments look fairly random, it's already 10%, you know, that's a relative paleo intensity, which is extremely high for a sediment. And so we're, looking at sediments that are usually 0.01 is our value for relative paleo intensity. Okay, and, and in this case, we can see what's quite common in rocks is that what we did was we took a random distribution, we slightly compacted it, then we turned on the field. And what we could see in this case is that we're catching the magnetic field direction with the remnants direction and we have the K1 axis or the M1 axis in the sedimentary plane, okay? So this would be how we can actually record the magnetic field in a rock and still have like, let's say a sedimentary fabric or what would be really typical with the sedimentary fabric. What's different in this case is that the percentage of anisotropy is increasing. And in this case, the percentage of the anisotropy is decreasing. And so uh, what we really wanted to know is can we use this anisotropy, remnants anisotropy on the remnants carrying grains, exactly what Kim was uh, talking about, uh, uh, to, to correct or to, to better understand the relative paleo intensity recorded. And so, what we need is we need very well characterized material. And so luckily our lab in Munich, we, we have two labs, one that's in the uh, forest uh, here. It's a 400 hectare forest. We have a pond and this pond is full of magnetotactic bacteria. So it's full of, it's what I would call live mud. 
Okay, and you can see these are uh, fork diagrams for that live mud, and we measure Verway transitions and Curie temperatures that are characteristic of magnetite. So this pond is really full of practically single domain magnetite that's carried by magnetotactic bacteria. And then what we do uh, is we do these redeposition experiments. And these were done by, by Huang He uh, for his PhD. You take these vessels and what you do is you slowly sediment over time until the vessel is completely full of mud. So uh, we have to let the water evaporate over time. And after about 40 days of repeated uh, redeposition experiments, we have a full uh, uh, sample. And these are the same uh, sample uh, vessels that are used by, by IODP. And what we did for these experiments, because we wanted a really a large range, is we used this thing called a whole back uh, uh, permanent magnet. So inside this magnet, it's actually 300 milliteslas. It's permanent. You don't need any electricity. And the direction of the field is not axial, but, it, but it's actually transversal. Right, And so we orient it parallel to the magnetic uh, inclination in the room. So everything is kind of pointing down. And what we see is that the magnetic field intensity is decreasing with distance. So we're using actually quite strong fields. So these are not Earth-like fields. They're 70 millitesla near the exit of the, of the whole back multipole magnet. And as we go, uh, further away, we get more and more Earth-like. So we have a very, very large range of uh, magnetic field strengths uh, that, that we're able to, to observe. So then what we do is we, we put these sealed caps directly on the sushi bar. Uh, so this is the system. This is the old sushi bar. I'll show you a picture of the new sushi bar in a minute. Um, but these are the, the experiments that I'll show you. So we have a cryogenic magnetometer. We have a track that has 99 samples. Here you can see the sample inside this, this shield is a rotatable AF demagnetizer or ARM uh, magnetizer uh, coil. Uh, that, that rotates. And because in this case, we can rotate the sample, we can rotate the coil, we can magnetize in several directions and everything is, is laser controlled. I'll show you that too later. That's the laser point. And so we put everything on the track. And so the first thing you could do is you can AF demagnetize your samples. And you can look when we're far away from the multipole, we see very linear magnetic trajectories. As we get close to the pole, there's a very high gradient. And so uh, you have to pay attention to this. And so when we're talking about uh, the anisotropy, when we're gonna measure the anisotropies, it's exactly the point that Ken said again, that we wanna target the remnants carrying. So if we're gonna fit this uh, high coercivity part of uh, the, the demagnetization spectra, we want to match that in the anisotropy uh, measurements. And this is really important for IODP cores or, or other things like that, because oftentimes you'll have an overprint component. And so you, if, if you're going to, you, you don't want to include the anisotropy measurements with that uh, component. And like I said, these are the best fit directions uh, and when we get very close to that pole piece, we have a, a deviation. And so when I show you the directions that we measure, we're going to actually take the paleomagnetic direction as magnetic north. Okay, so that's our north in, in our experiments. I want to show you a couple of caveats. Before I start showing you a lot of anisotropy data, I want to insist on problems that we're all facing and that we haven't really addressed right now. And 
I'm going to do that with, uh, this is the measurement scheme that we're using. This is the hexed kind of measurement scheme uh, that we do on the sushi bar. It's a 12 position uh, measurement. So what you're seeing here are the individual measurements on the sushi bar, uh, ARM magnetizations of 99 samples. So these again are dominated by magnetite. And the reason why you have to do the plus and the minus, the antipode directions, is if you have an NRM, if you do have hematite there, it's going to deflect, you know, your two antipodal directions kind of in the same way. So they're not going to be antipodal. So if you subtract, if you do like a vector subtraction, and because these are negative, uh, you'll divide by two. So we're getting the average a vector, and if your NRM is constant, you'll subtract that away, okay? So it's very important for anybody doing ARM anisotropy that they do these antipode techniques. So this is one. Number two, what I wanna show you is I wanna show you the sensitivity uh, to, uh, to, to the technique, to, to, the, to the tensor, and how you're gonna calculate this, right? And so we built the sushi bar ourselves and we tried to make it so we could get these ideal directions, right? And so these are, uh, you know, these are the antipode directions. So you only see six, these are, they're actually 12. And this is what you would get if you calculated these tensors from what we would call the ideal sushi bar. All right, you, everybody here would agree, oh, that looks pretty good. It looks like a, a sedimentary fabric, you know, the, the M1, what I would call M1, not K1s, because it's, it's moments uh, are, are close to, to vertical. And we have the K2, the K1s and the K2s in the sedimentary plane. Or you could say that we don't make the sushi bar perfectly. And maybe what we'll do is we'll just calculate the average of all of our measurements, and then we'll, we'll calculate the tensor from those average directions. So what I want to show everybody here is how similar the average is to the expected and what an influence it has on the outcome uh, of the directional outcome. And in our case, this is because you know, maybe we have fairly weak anisotropy, so definitely less than 10%. And so the problem, you know, you could say might go away if you use an IRM technique, but in a way it's kind of a false go away. It's just because, you know, you have much stronger moments. And so the, you know, the, you know, the average and the ideal might be much, much closer to the spectrum. It doesn't mean that it's the right result. And finally, we have the projection method. This was developed by Michael Vach. And uh, this is what we're actually using. This has no a, a priori knowledge of how we built the sushi bar. It just starts off with an assumption and then it, it, it goes to a minimalized routine. And we think that, that this is really the best way uh, to treat the data is with Mikhail's projection method. And so the data that I'm gonna show you is treated uh, with the projection method. There's another caveat that I want everybody to understand. And again, uh, Andrea was talking about this in terms of magnetic viscosity, okay? Now these are where we give our sample an ARM, uh, let's say, at a certain time, and then we just measure the decay of the moment over time. And these are, you know, these are like, let's say six or seven or eight random samples. And what you can see is here's 10 minutes and, you know, here's like a few minutes. And you can see that if you do not control the time of acquisition and the time of measurement, that you can get a few percent difference in magnetization, and this is going to influence your, your anisotropy uh, data and your result. And so this is why, you know, 
what we know from Horst Worm's uh, measurements is that the viscosity is going to increase as you have an IRM. So, so this, the stronger your magnetization field, the more uh, the decay, the more the viscosity is going to look like over time. And this is why you need to wait or you either need to time your measurements. So if you're going to do multiple measurements in multiple uh, directions, you either have to time the acquisition and the measurement or you use a sushi bar where it's always like accurately uh, two hours. It takes about uh, three to four hours to go around that track and about two hours between the acquisition uh, to the measurement. And that's very precise. And that's really on this flat. This is a log scale. So it's really where you're on the flat curve. Okay, there's another thing I'd like everybody to be aware about because we've been talking about inclination shallowing. And I'm seeing this time and time again where people are using samples with a strong shape anisotropy to do their inclination shallowing corrections. Okay, and here, these are like our first study where we didn't pay attention so much to whether one of our cups was all the way full or not all the way full. And so what I'm showing you are data that we did not use, but I think they're very instructive, is that here is the percentage of anisotropy, okay? And so when we have a fully full cup, we're expecting about this mass, and you can see that as the mass gets lower and lower, what it means is that the cup is not filled, okay? So the less the cup is filled, the, the, the more shape anisotropy we have. So the smaller, let's say the, the minimum axis is to the maximum axis, and this has a strong effect. So whenever you're measuring some kind of a, of a, of a sample, you, you should have no shape anisotropy for your sample. And you can think that this is trivial because we've actually experimented uh, with, different, uh, with different kind of vessels. And this was actually the first vessel we used because it can fit in those cups of the sushi bar. And actually it already has a strong shape anisotropy. And, and what I, I think that we've convinced ourselves is even these IODP cups have a little bit of a shape anisotropy uh, kind of in the 45 degree direction. And so what we've done is we've actually bought our own cups that we've tried to have as, as little shape anisotropy as there is. Okay, so those are the caveats and the pitfalls. And now we're gonna go back uh, to the data. So the first thing, is because we have a very wide range of fields, uh, we could get actually a very good fit to the relative paleo intensities. And so I, I have actually a lot of confidence in this correction, uh, which I can show you that when you go to very low fields or, or you do a very small range of magnetic fields, there are over two orders of magnitude of field here that we actually get quite quite a good linear fit with, with the relative paleo intensity. And now here is a comparison of those samples done with, you know, and what I use now, I used to use like AARM or, or things like that, but I thought that the most logical way to do it was, well, if we have AMS, we might as well do AMR, right? So this is how I do it now. And you can see that there's a, actually a, a fairly good, so the color scale is the same for both these plots. And here you kind of see P, which is the percentage of anisotropy. T is the shape parameter, so oblate and prolate. And what you can see is that at very low field intensities, we do have something that looks like a sedimentary fabric. And as we go to higher and higher fields, we go very prolate and the percentage of anisotropy increases. And this is exactly what, you know, this proof of concept was for us. And I think Andrea was also talking about, you know, how to use like multi-proxy and that we need to be careful because here's the AMS and the AMS contribution is probably like 90% of, of the entire rock. And so here we're, 
we have a much more disordered system with paramagnetic uh, material, you know, the, the, the matrix in the sample. And so here we, we do get a fairly good uh, distribution. I mean, we can see that as we go to higher and higher fields, that here the K3 is lowering like we do with AMR. What we would though expect here is that, and we almost reach, this is the magnetic field direction. And so we do almost reach the magnetic field direction uh, with the M, M1. So this would be K1s, which are much more scattered for the AMS. And also, you know, the eigenvalues are also uh, much more scattered. Um, and you can see that here on this plot. So this is taking uh, with the entire range of the, the magnetic field that we've applied and here with the AMR, we've almost reached uh, the, the mean inclination, uh, AMS not, not quite. Um, and here, if we're, we're focusing in the low field values, uh, we have much different behavior between the AMS and the AMR. So I just wanted everybody to be uh, aware of that. Uh, and then we tried to model this. So what we could do is we could uh, then have like a, a, a Nagata model. So this is like the perfect viscous model where we have, you know, a torque fork, uh, a, 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 a torque force couple between the magnetization of a particle and the magnetic field and viscosity. And it, it, it goes over time. So what we actually do is we kind of scale uh, for time with these experiments. And what you can see is that it's not so bad with the relative paleo intensity experiments, especially uh, with the highest fields. But when we, we take into account the AMR, we have a much harder time uh, of using just all of the grains in this uh, model. If we take another approach and we say, well, most of the grains are actually stuck and not able to reorient. They're stuck as we were talking in, in the chat, like to clays and things like that. And that they're almost randomly oriented. I mean, we have like a slight sedimentary fabric. So a 2% that's in the, the sedimentary plane, but it's a very weak fabric. And then we rerun the model. What we find is that at the low magnetic fields uh, that we can match it fairly well. At the high fields, we don't. And this is because in the Nagata model, you know, at the very high fields, you know, we're, we're unsticking all the grains. And so this model doesn't, you know, doesn't unstick those grains that couldn't rotate before. Like in this case, they're all able to rotate. And in the end, we saw that we had a lot of variability. And so what we did was we just kind of let the model be, be variable about the different starting factors, uh, uh, you know, the fraction of particles that are, that are free to orient, all these things we let go and we just run the model several times. And what we found is that we could match, especially at these low field values, uh, you know, I, I would say quite successfully is, is what we do is, is below uh, 10 millitesimals. And so now in the conclusions is that I do think that we're, we're getting there and I do think that we will get to the state where we could use AMR to, to better correct for, or better understand the variability. But now I wanna show you our old uh, data, the data that was done with Sushi Bar 1, and I'm going to explain why we, were, we built Sushi Bar 2. And so these are repeat experiments in Earth-like fields. So these are microteslas, no longer milliteslas. So here's 100 microtesla, and here's 100 milliteslas. And these are in each, we, we have two different directions for each intensity. And what you can see, I'm just showing, these are for the 100 micro 
uh, Tesla fields, we catch the magnetic field perfectly. This is exactly what Dario is saying or somebody was saying. Uh, maybe, you know, we catch the magnetic field immediately. So there's no problem with recording. You can see the K value and the alpha 95 from 25 samples uh, in, in a zero inclination, or even we do have a little bit of inclination shallowing. This should be 60. And we have about five degrees of inclination shallowing, but we have like a factor of two difference in, in the relative paleo intensity. And this is what we're trying to figure out right now. I mean, so, you know, what we can see, here's a relative paleo intensity for one of these runs here. And what we can see is that there is a correlation between the magnetic foliation, let's say, or, or the anisotropy and the relative paleo intensity. And so this is where, what we're trying to do now and we didn't think that we had the precision uh, to do this uh, during Kwong's thesis. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show, I'm going to just stop this movie for a second. So this is the second generation of the sushi bar uh, that, that, that's working well. So before we had these two workstations and now we have two more. Okay, and the, the sample holder and the way that we can manipulate a sample now is totally different than what it was before. And so now what we have is we have also a frequency and amplitude dependent of susceptibility. Here we have flux gate magnetometers. So if you have super strong samples that you can't measure in the magnetometer, you can just measure them in the flux gates. And we also have Walter Schillinger's kind of AF uh, met glass that can also not, not yet, but in the future will be able to also give our samples IRMs with the met glass coil. And so now what I'd like to do is I'll just show you this. I made this movie. I'm making it with my, my cell phone. So it's shaky and I'm, I'm filming uh, here at this position. And so what you'll see is here's the laser light and we'll see the track move. And then we'll see the sample go up and the sample rotate about two axes instead of one axis before. Okay, so we start, the track was on sample whatever, now it's sample one. And uh, this is our laser mark that you, you correlate the, the sample with now. The sample's picked up off the track. Here it's going through the fluxgate magnetometer, or it could go up above into the uh, thing. Now we can rotate about the sample's z-axis, let's say. And I'm not making it stop, you know, or I should say Mikael is not making it stop when we hit the mark. We're just kind of showing uh, what we could do with it. And sorry for my handshaking. And now we're, we can also rotate about uh, like the vertical axis of the thing. So what that's letting us do now is instead of, uh, you know, we now have these workstations and instead of using this six times two uh, thing, we're right now, right now on the track are uh, 75 redeposition samples that, that Felix is doing this 20 times two uh, position AMR. And again, these are always done in the remnants bearing fraction. So usually at the higher coercivity range. And Dave Finn just ran uh, a sample that's super duper exciting. He's got his own technique. Maybe he'll present it. I don't know. Next, next uh, uh, thing where he did 61 measurements and after each measurement, he did a really complex AF demagnetization. We just got those results on, on Sunday. So that's kind of the state where we're at with remnants and isotropy measurements. So thank you uh, to everybody and go ahead and ask questions. Thank you, Stuart. So do we have questions? I have a question, Stuart. 
Yeah. Go ahead, How Mario. do you, so pertaining to the problem of the uh, sample shape and the anisotropy of the sample, right? So you measured mud from, from the lake containing bacteria. And of course, as the sample dries, it will lose volume, right? So how did you immobilize the sample or did you just go along with having anisotropy? Which I have to say is a comment, I think that's fine as long as you're comparing apple to apples and you're using the same samples within a set of experiments and not comparing them to nature or to other experiments, right? Well, well I mean, yeah, so I mean, all the redeposition experiments are made in identical ways. Right, so we what we do is we actually take the pond mud into the lab, and then you get a straw, uh, and you you kind of put them in, and you never let the samples dry out, right, completely. So so what you're doing is you're you're kind of doing what you would do in nature, right? You're slowly depositing in a wet environment, and this is also an important point: is this is live mud. This is not dead mud. We're not mm -hmm. taking the rock. That, that's dead and, and hasn't had all of the, let's say the ion, whatever that, that, that's taken out of it. These actually are, are live sediments. So they have bacteria in them. You look at it under a microscope and there's, there's probably some bioturbation going on. And so probably one of the difference that we have could be due to differences in bioturbation, right? That, that I can't, I, I, I can't uh, exclude that. But I think for, for an experiment, it's pretty close to, to the best we can do. And even when you rotate the specimen to measure the anisotropy? Yeah, well, then we, we put a cap on it, right? So it's dry, it, it, it can't be wet because if it's wet, you, you know this, I mean, right. if it's and wet, you, you, then the particles sorry. are free to rotate. So I mean, we let it, you know, it's like a, a, a solid sample with a cap on it. And then we, we put it on the sushi bar. So you, the other you're, thing- You're hoping that the vacuum is so good that the specimen is not slushy in there, essentially. No, it's, it's, it's not slushy. And, and I mean, you can see that in the, in the demagnetization directions that I showed, right? We get an alpha 95 of, of less than one degree. Right, I mean the precision is amazing, right? In the direction, so I don't see, and even at very low fields, I haven't even shown you like like extremely low fields. Uh, the precision is is really really good. So I, I I don't I don't have a problem there, you know, like like the the problem also that could be like that you could worry about if the sample dried out too much then it would rotate in the, in the sample holder itself. But then you'd see that in the error of the, the AFD mag and we, and we don't see that. It would tend to stick to the box. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Sometimes what you see, if you, you leave them on the shelf for a long time, they'll actually just break apart into little Shrink pieces. Them. Right, right. Okay, another very quick question. So. Um, going to natural environments, where would you expect this um, um, uh, anisotropy paleointensity uh, technique to work? Well, I would expect it to work. I mean, I would expect it really to work everywhere. So in the sushi bar paper, uh, Michel did it with magnetite and hematite bearing samples. And as right. you go up in, in uh, like let's say coercivity window, we can see the difference in the anisotropy in the very last, uh, the, the highest uh, window that he used, the K1 directions did go into the paleomagnetic field direction. So like I say, we've been doing this to uh, ODP samples and I would say it's quite, quite successful. I'm quite happy uh, with it. Uh, we're, we're, you know, the problem with the ODP samples that you don't see, and I, and I, I mean, that's a whole other talk, is like what happens when you get a chemical remnants, and you never see this, like we're, we're using ODP cores that people have only said we only have magnetite in our cores, and what we're seeing is like we see things like GRMs, right, 
so, and we're seeing like what, what I would interpret as Grigai in those samples. And actually the Grigai horizons that you would never see really in a normal AFD magnetization have very different fabrics than the non-GRM samples. So the samples that, that are probably not chemical remnants. So I actually, the sushi bar is amazing, like for, for parameter space. And, and like I say, where we're able to, you know, right now Leon Kaub is, is putting on the susceptibility meter that can also do frequency right now. It's, it has a very good comparability with the Bardington at one frequency, but we should be able to go to at least four orders of magnitude difference in frequency and, and in amplitude. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so we've got quite a few questions. Ken, you had your hand up, and then Kathy and Andre. So Ken, go ahead. Yeah, just real quick. When you talk about the shape anisotropy effect of the samples, how strongly magnetized are those samples, Stuart? I mean, I thought it was a function of the strength of the magnetization. No, no. I mean, these, these samples, so these are what I would call, you saw the relative paleo intensity, right? So it's, it's 0.1, you know, 0.01, which is comparable to any ODP core you get. So these are, you know, these give, like if I look at the ODP core, I look at, at our redeposited re sediments, I don't get a big difference uh, with that. Um, so it's, it's not, it's, no, I mean, the shape, the shape effect is really important. So uh, it's really important for weakly magnetized sedimentary rocks. I think it's important for every rock. Hmm. I think it's important for every rock. Okay. Mm -hmm. Happy? Uh, yeah, so my question is also about the uh, shape and isotropy. And um, I'm wondering um, whether it's a reflection of uh, position in relation to the different um, responses of the various axes of the magnetometer. No. No, Which I don't obviously see why. We have well, the width of the sample uh, actually does, in, and, the, and also its placement within the center of the uh, center region actually has a strong effect, could have a strong effect on the anisotropy perhaps, unless you're very careful in the way that you're averaging oh, those things. You're right. If the, if the distribution of the magnets was very anisotropic, right? So if the magnets were all on one side of the, the sample, then what you're saying could be true. And it would also be true, again, if you had a sample with a very strong shape anisotropy. So getting into there, because if you look at the homogeneity function of a squid magnetometer, um, like the one that we have in Munich, you know, it's Gaussian distributed, you know, it's a little bit flat at the top, but, but the flatness of the top, so if you have like a 4.2 centimeter diameter bore, probably the flatness is about two centimeters. So if you look at the curves from, from 2G, for example. And so if you do have something that has a strong shape anisotropy, we worried about this with Dario's experiments because as he was depositing over time, right? This could, could really play a role with homogeneity. Uh, so that would be good. And that's why like, like I would, you know, we have the large bore, you know, when I got here, we bought the large bore magnetometer, which is like the 7.8 centimeter. And there, the homogeneity is flat for like four centimeters. And that's why, you know, depending on the strategy of your lab, I would really go for the large bore versus the small bore. Yeah, because you have a different response function in the various axes as well. Yeah, yeah. In fact, okay, I'm glad you asked that uh, because I was going to ask Andrea this. So what Andrea showed in her stepwise demagnetization was a rounding of the moment. And this is why, like when I first did this at the Paris lab, when I was in Paris, we had the the automated 2G system. And the automated 2G system has three independent demagnetization coils. 
And what you'll see is that each coil has its own gain, okay? And so if you, if you actually give your sample an IRM 4545 and you stepwise demagnetize it with the 2G system, you'll see that there's a rounding of the demagnetization because you're going to demagnetize better in certain directions than others. And this is why I would recommend to everybody to use uh, one coil, not, not, not three different independent coils. So even if you do have a bias, um, that the bias won't affect the result, let's say, that, that, that you, you know, you're going to have the same bias for all axes. I could go on about that if you have more questions. I can tell you exactly. I mean, there are real problems with coil designs and Michel's design is, is amazing. And that's what's used on the rapid system, right? So Michel gave all of his codes on the Adwin system to rapid. So if anybody's using a rapid system, they're actually the, the, the origin is, is Michel's Adwin codes. Okay, thank you. Andre, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Stuart, for this great talk. And uh, the question is, uh, when you're going to to the smallest uh, to the smallest fields, uh, can you really can you really discriminate M one from um, M two in in your plane? Okay. Um, I don't hear Andre anymore. Does the okay for so everybody else? I'll repeat Andre's question. Oh. So Andre's question is: is what happens when we go to the low fields? Can we distinguish the anisotropy? And actually, uh, this is an embarrassing answer, but we're scientists, so we should be full full disclosure on our embarrassment, right? Because that drives us forward. So when Kwong first did the redeposition experiments in one microtesla fields, we saw something that I couldn't explain. You know, it, 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 it actually looked like a GRM, right? So it's like, it kind of demagnetized and then it remagnetized in all of his samples. And I'm like, you know, I just kind of threw the samples away until I met Dave Finn, who sees GRM everywhere. Right. And I was like, well, if I see, you know, I should see GRM in these samples because it's all single to me. And, th and that got me really thinking about this. And I thought, oh, we could use GRM as a proxy for magnetic field strength. Right. Because I saw it only in the low fields. Once you go to 10 micro Teslas or higher, I don't see it anymore. And the reason and, and David uh, started modeling it and what what he convinced me of is that it had nothing to do with GRM. It had to do with uh, a slight bias field in the AF waveform, okay? And, and you get a parasite in the AF waveform that you would never ever see in a rock that, that its NRM was strong enough, right? You would never ever see it. But when you had almost like a zero magnetization, that bias field was enough to give it something that looked like a GRM. And in fact, in the Adwin system, if you look at the amplifier that we use in the lab, it's almost a PPM uh, accuracy in, in magnetic field control, 10 to the minus five, but that 10 to the minus five, so that's like, it's about two, micro Tesla at a hundred millitesla field, right? And that's what we were seeing. And this is why we're actually redoing all these measurements all over again, right? And, and this time what we're also doing is zero field redeposition. Uh, so those are actually right on the sushi bar right now. Um, Thank you. It's not, sorry. So maybe that was a good transition to our okay. last talk, since good. we have the pleasure of listening to David Finn. Okay. I've heard his name now a few.